Well, hello everybody and welcome to Fire and Wire. This time we're going beyond the podcast in here, the university's fantastic botanic garden and arboretum. And I'm delighted to be here with Dr. Chris Thurgood, who is the deputy director and he's also head of science at this incredible garden. We're looking at Britain's oldest botanic garden. So founded in 1621, it was built up by, um, I think 4,000 wagon loads of muck and dung by the University Scavenger. Um, so the plants grow yeah. very well right. still. Good, good. Um, and it was um, particularly to grow medicinal plants to teach you the, the university's medical students about how plants were used in herbal medicine. Because somebody who's still teaching the medical students about pain and reef and yeah. different ways that we can do that, yeah. I'm all ears to hear more about it. Let's so let's go. some plants. Yeah, wonderful. So we're standing here in the taxonomic beds and we have a collection of some 5,000 or so different types of plant from all around the world. And that's what's so wonderful about a, a university botanic garden. And this collection of plants um, serves a vital role in, um, in research. And so we have researchers sort of using these taxonomic beds as a, a, um, a living DNA library, if you will, of, of plants and also students. And we teach in the botanic garden as, as well. So, so the students actually come down. They do. Lectures, they right? do. And so we run practicals here in the botanic garden with our biology students who, who can actually sort of walk through the, um, the flowering plant family tree and, and, and so learn through that experience. Oh, how extraordinary. What yeah, a treat. It's truly immersive. Oh, well, you can't beat that immersive sort of learning experience. Yeah. Now, can you give us just sort of a quick summary and simple explanation of what you mean by taxonomic? Because obviously yeah. it's a key part of the garden. Originally, these beds were organised by how the plants appeared. So plants that looked like one another were, were classified together. But actually, um, over the last few decades, scientists have sequenced the DNA of these plants. And so we now know more than ever before about how those plants are related. And so um, the team here has reorganised the beds according to their genetic relatedness. And so you can walk through um, the, the DNA sort of family tree, if you will, of, of flowering plants, and you can see how plants are related to one another. Fantastic. I mean, that's, that's the, the wonderful thing about a botanic garden. And of course, that brings in the evolution then of the plants exactly. and where they split on that's that. It. Fantastic. Well, look, yeah. show me some more. Please follow me. Lovely to see so many people around as well. Yes, but actually yeah. not too busy because yeah. during the summer holiday, is yeah. which is Even. lovely for us and yeah. commercial income, but yeah. it's quite gentle on a day like today. Yeah, yeah. So Irene, we should just stop here so oh, I can show you right. our oldest living specimen. Oh, wow, a tree. <laughs> it is, oh, it is. It's an English wow. yew, Taxus yeah. baccata. Right. And it was planted in 1645 Goodness. by a man called Jacob Bobart the Elder, mm -hmm. who was the Botanic Garden's first keeper. And so he um, planted up the garden in the 1640s and he would have planted this yew tree along with several others probably along this main path. And it, it may have been clipped actually as part of a topiary display and perhaps that's one of the reasons it's a little smaller than you might expect for a tree of this age. Right. Um, and we also lost some of it in Storm Kira, but oh, yew trees okay. are very um, easily regenerated yes. and, and so it's actually recovered quite well. Um, Extraordinary, 1645. I, I mean, know. it's just jaw dropping. Yes. Trees are my sort of favourite. Oh, of all I actually lovely. Love them. I just love the majesty of yes. them and the fact that they, yeah live for hundreds of yeah, years yeah, you know yeah. particularly this particular yeah, type exactly and just just the history they've seen e exactly know. sort of this this garden as it's changed through sort of um the, the conditions along with oxford al alongside it and the things that it's yeah. that it's seen it's over the course of several yeah. centuries the and it's yes kept. <laughs> exactly no there's a certain sort of resonance a whisper of of um of time in the botanic garden yeah. when you walk among trees like these um, and we hope it will see several hundred years still well let's hope and probably time enough for us yep. to walk to the next area, so follow me. Yep. Great, okay, so we're in a very different bit of the garden, Chris, yeah. now, so... It's got quite yeah. a little different looking feel, hasn't yeah, it? So it this really is the does. lower garden, Irene, so we were in the um, the walled physic garden, as was, the yep. historic garden, and we've entered the lower garden, so it's a lot less formal. Yep. Um, and we're standing at the moment in our rock garden, which mm -hmm. has a, a Mediterranean theme. It really does. And I, a, I love this. Lovely. It does, yeah, it does. It's, it's really evocative yeah. of the Mediterranean. Yeah. You know, that's exactly what we wanted to achieve, to yeah. give people that experience to walk through a, um, a garrigue or a maki, as we call it, vegetation type. Those lovely oils mm. that volatilise from the plants. Certainly the smells, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I just feel like I'm in the Mediterranean on a little, little mini break. <laughs> Not in the middle of city centre on the high street. No, no, yeah. Exactly. yeah, how fantastic. Yeah. Great. And there's something special you want to show me as well, as there I is. understand it. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I'm embracing myself for this. Come on. <laughs> so am I. I. No risk assessment, I think. I can't, oh, I I can't afford to. I'll avert my eyes. Yeah, exactly. 
We, we had Raymond Blanc here and he started oh. eating. I was like, Raymond, oh. no. <laughs> so let me yeah. introduce you the squirting cucumber. You're kidding. So the, this is um, Ekbaliums. This is actually a relative of the cucumber right. that, that we're familiar with, but this is not an edible one. Okay. And it's actually explosive. So this is the, the little missile waiting to explode. Right. Um, and so this capsule has a buildup internally of turga pressure, so a water buildup in, inside the, the capsule. And what this does is it fires the seeds out in a jet that's quite explosive and quite disturbing. <laughs> so I'm going to try and direct it away from us. Okay. And are we ready? Yeah, I'm gonna, ready. Let's ready? go for it. Oh, gee. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, that was spectacular. <laughs> why, why does it do it? Yeah, do you know, that's one of the questions we're actually seeking to understand, right. Irene. So we've done all sorts of things with these squirting cucumbers, from CT scanning them, to mathematically modelling them, to answer those questions. How and why are these plants the way they are? How, how with the mathematician? Where's the maths? If this cucumber fires its seeds over the course of, let's say, nine metres, and if those seeds grow and certain numbers survive, what would that look like in future generations? Mm. And then we can start to understand, well, what might be the selective advantage in terms of evolution for these fruits exploding their seeds in a sort of linear transect, if you like, of several metres. And it might be that that's to get the future generations of plants away from the parent plant to reduce competition, for of course, example. Of course, so, it makes such sense. Now yeah. you, now you explain like that. OK, I've got to have a go. Is that, is that can I? Please do, to give it a gentle through? touch and okay. it shoots. Go, guys. Oh. <laughs> wow, I barely got it. touched it. Yeah, I know. How spectacular. It's very sensitive. Wow. <laughs> and so it'll just spontaneously do that yeah, it does. at some point when it's ready. It, it yeah? will do it of its own accord when it reaches yeah. a, a sort of a certain threshold. Yep. But otherwise, if you touch it, then it does it early. So yeah. <laughs> that was it was impressive. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's get somewhere safe. Yeah. <laughs> Follow me. Great. Thanks, Chris. That was terrific. That was a good one, wasn't it? Like that. that was a good one. Yeah, I've got a break. <laughs> so, Chris, you brought me to this bit now. Yes. Um, I can hear some kids playing rugby in the background there, which is lovely to hear. We've got birds squawking and twittering away. I'm looking at probably Ox's most spectacular border. Yeah. Um, tell me why you <laughs> wanted to show me this. And... Happy to you say that, Irene. So, so we're standing, we're still in the lower garden and we're standing next to the herbaceous border. Um, and it's, I love it because it just changes so much with the season. So if you come here in the spring, you'll see all the bulbs flowering. And then in, in September, it's just this sort of riot of, of colour and everything sort of jostling for space, jostling yeah. for position. And I, I think it's a, a, a real spectacle. And you know, we have 200,000 or so people come to the Botanic Garden Arboretum every year. And, and they, they love seeing this this, uh, yeah. this border and walking past it. And I, I think more than that, more than people loving to see it, I think it's actually really an important part of Oxford's green estate, mm -hmm. the Botanic Garden, and that people find sanctuary here. And, and it's an important part of people's mental health and oh, well-being could, coming to green spaces like this. I couldn't this. agree more. I mean, I think we saw that during the pandemic. Yes. People just really sought out, didn't they, yeah. getting into parks, having, I think, an appreciation yeah. again of just they, the value. They did, and brings. they did, and we, we saw that, and we saw people actually had quite an emotional response when they came back to the, the Arboretum in, in particular, actually, yeah. a really, really strong connection with the site. Yeah. I know that you're doing some collaboration with yes. some of my colleagues, you yeah, know, as a yeah. neuroscientist yeah, and, and yeah. things. So tell me a little bit more about the yeah. sort of programs you're doing there. Yeah, so we work closely with Professor John Geddes and his team on the, the flourishing theme um, of his um, biomedical research centre project, um, particularly seeking to understand, uh, we talk about the, the benefits um, that green spaces and nature bring to, to mental health, brain health and well-being. Um, but how do, we, how do we understand what that looks like? What, what is a, a dose of, of green health, for example? Um, and so we're, we're very much looking forward to working with John and his colleagues to use these green spaces as, as um, sort of living laboratories yeah. um, for, for seeking to understand that. So, so that's a really exciting well, really piece of work. So and get some sort of data, you know, evidence. E exactly. Evi and how we can then roll that out. Evidence-based, yeah. quite, quite. And then also um, linked to that, we're doing a lot of work engaging with new audiences and underrepresented groups at both our sites as well so that um, as many people as possible can yep. benefit um, from what green spaces like ours have to offer. Fantastic I and mean, 200,000 visitors you said that's yeah. just heartwarming for me to hear because as you know I'm really passionate about yeah. our role in the local community yeah. and the national and again having this extraordinary privileged set yeah. of places that we've got and we, we get the chance to look after and curate Indeed. Um, available for more people to come and see so it's just wonderful it's to hear that. It's a privilege that. yeah. Fantastic yeah. wow and, and we're seeing it at its best you'd say September is it's is a, the sort of it's, it's a little past just its a best. little okay a little okay okay um, and it's been a difficult summer but it's still looking fine yeah it's a bit fabulous <laughs> <laughs> no complaints from yeah. me <laughs> great so onwards we go yes, yeah follow me <laughs> So 
So Chris, we're in the boiling glass houses. No, sweltering. Ugh. It's like a sauna. Um, I want to hear about your research. You told us about the amazing collaborations you're doing with uh, psychiatry and with maths. Um, but I know that you've got a very particular interest in your research area. So let's hear about your work and tell us why we're in here. Um, thanks, Irene. Well, I, I work with Bostonists all over the world, but I'm going to tell you about um, a particular set of projects that I've been working on quite recently, um, broadly under the subject of biomimetics, which is how we can look at nature for solutions to problems in design and technology, for example. Right. And I'll start with a, a little story. So we have in front of us these... Um, botanical enigmas as I think of them, these uh -huh. extraordinary floating platforms. So these are the, the world's largest floating leaves, yeah, they belong huge. to the, the yeah. genus Victoria and these are actually quite small in the middle of the summer they're even growing larger. Right. Um, so it's a, a giant Amazonian water lily and my physicist friends, uh, I was showing them around this pond and they said to me, oh Chris how and why do these leaves grow so large? And I said, oh well you know leaves are for photosynthesis so the larger the surface area the better it, it serves the plant. But they said, well, you know, but not all leaves grow that large. And so I thought, well, this is curious. How and why do these leaves grow so large? And so we did a bit of research. And to our astonishment, no one had actually sought to answer that question. How and why do these water leaves grow so large? And so we set about to, to address that. And we did all sorts of experiments to look at the load bearing capacity, the strength, the elasticity, um, and all sorts of other things. So we were prodding them, sinking them, pulverizing them, weighing them. <laughs> And what we found is that the, the structure of this enormous leaf right. is what defines its, its strength and ability, um, and to, ability to grow, grow so large. Right. And so you can see one that the, 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 the team here flipped over, oh, so you can flipped see the underside. That. I see, so that's the underside. That's the right. underside. Gosh, that's it's it's pretty robust, yeah. And, and it has yeah. this, this extraordinary um, lattice of sort of intersecting yeah. girders, if, if you like. Um, and then those are covered in a very thin sort of elastic sheet. Mm -hmm. And actually, what we found, again, through mathematical modelling, is that um, for this size, the optimum is this structure. In other words, it's the, the minimum amount of stuff that you can formulate to cover the largest amount of surface area and still be strong enough to withstand um, right. any sort of perturbations or stresses in, in your environment. Extraordinary. And of course, there's a cost to growing such a large leaf yeah, because you have to service your, your yeah. real estate. You know, yes, uh, it, yeah. it requires plumbing and maintenance. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's, that's what we found. And so this is um, an economically very efficient structure. And why we think that's exciting is that that might be a source of inspiration for, for example, floating offshore solar farms. Yeah, so we're very excited by that. Yeah. And then as we're standing here, this is a, a, another... This pool. is a, well, pitcher plants I yeah, love. Oh, They're always yeah. actually fascinating. Yeah. So, so why, why are you into them? I've, you know, I've always loved these plants ever since I was a kid. And so I, I feel so lucky to be able to actually work on them now here in Oxford. But we're interested in why particular these slippery rims that insects tumble off and, and fall into this stomach, yep. if you will. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. How and why are they such different shapes and sizes, the different geometries? And so my, my clever colleagues have done all sorts of mathematical modelling to, to look at um, computational insects yep. and how they behave on different parts of that structure. Right. And what we found in our recent research is that the different geometries of these peristomes, they're called, on the trap, have a profound impact on the size and the type of prey that these plants can attract and so when we think of for example Darwin's finches in the yes. Galapagos Islands and they have different beak shapes yes. that, that are adapted to tapping into different sources of food so with plants such as these they have different shapes and sizes of trap so if, if, if I can ask you to feel this surface and you'll feel it's rough in one plane yes. and smooth in another. Oh it's silky in yeah. the other, oh it's so, lovely. So yeah. it's, it's covered in these um, ridges mm -hmm. that you can think of as energy railings my, my physicist colleagues call them and these actually direct insects into the trap in a way that's non-arbitrary so they're slipping in a way that's very tightly controlled they're sort of driven into the trap and this also has an application in microfluidics yes, and, a, and a form yes, of technology of called slip, slippery liquid infused porous surface technology slips okay. which is used in all sorts of um, everyday objects yep. and so um, microfluidics are used in medical devices yep. and also yep. inkjet printers yeah, and this can be informed by these wow. wonderful adaptive surfaces in pitcher plants well of course plants have had millions of years of evolution and, and to fine-tune exactly how they do things so you know we often think that we know everything um, but there's so much amazing <laughs> stuff that we we just need to keep learning from plants there's don't we so much we can learn from yeah. nature oh, exactly. fantastic. great now, i can't help but observe these glass houses look you know 
they look old and they look like <laughs> they need a bit more TLC or yeah. we need to just really radically improve yeah. the working conditions that, that you have here. So that, that's tell right. me about the ambition for that and how can we help? Yeah, so that's, that's our big priority here at the Botanic Garden is to fundraise for new glass houses. So yep. just as you say, Irene, the, the infrastructure, beautiful though the plants are that are grown inside, yep. um, the infrastructure itself um, is beyond its sort of use by date, to be honest. Yeah. So the, um, the glass houses were built in the early 1970s and um, they're, they're not really in some places fit for purpose now. And so it's, it's vital that to achieve this mission of inspiring people with the scientific wonder of plants and growing these wonderful things to support research and education, that we have the infrastructure to support that. So that's our, yeah. our priority here is, is to actually build new glass houses yeah. to enable us to, to do that. And I should add, sorry, I should mm. add that um, it will reduce our carbon footprint by 92% <gasps> if we have new glass houses. So well, because these are leaking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because so. energy is just pouring out. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So yeah. it's very important okay. for us. Okay, well, that's a, that's a great challenge. So, noted. <laughs> <laughs> So Chris, we're getting to sort of what I call June o'clock time yeah. of the evening. I'm smelling juniper. I'm seeing yeah. these beautiful roses. Yeah. Um, I know that you make something very special here with the botanicals. Tell me about it. So we're yeah. sitting in the gin bed, actually, yeah. Irene. So. <laughs> my favourite go-to place. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so we actually have a partnership with um, Oxford Artisan Distillery, mm -hmm. who um, harvest botanicals from the botanic garden to make physic gin. Um, and the list of botanicals is actually inspired by that original list of plants that were grown here in the Botanic Garden in 1648. So it's a little bit like drinking history. So it's yeah. a very special gin. Um, it's also our blockbuster product in the Botanic Garden shop as well. So it's <laughs> what does that say? Commercial income. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> about our visitors. Yeah. Um, but you know, commercial income is important yeah, to the Botanic course, Garden, yeah. and, and we also yeah. develop, for example, that we're sitting next to this lovely rose, which mm, you, I know stunning. you just pointed out, which yeah. is um, Oxford um, Physic Rose, which was also developed. Um, by us in partnership with a rose breeder as, mm -hmm. as well and launched at the Chelsea Flower Show last year as well and it's, it's beautiful isn't it? And that was to celebrate our, our 400th anniversary. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's, a it's a beautiful rose, it's absolutely lovely. It, it looks pretty resilient too yeah, as I is. understand it. Yeah, it uh, is. Yeah, yeah. Yes, the usual happy. things that affect yes. roses. Yeah. yeah. So Chris, before I have then my gin and tonic this <laughs> evening, um, you know, why should a university like Oxford have a botanic garden? Just tell us why it's so important to have places like this. Yeah. Plants are actually the answer to many of the global challenges that we face. Um, plants are the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the medicines we take. And yet we live in an era when many people actually scarcely notice the plants or don't engage with them. Um, so we as human beings, as animals, are very much attuned to other animals in, um, in our world less so plants actually and this is a, a phenomenon that social scientists have called metaphorically plant blindness mm. uh, we're simply less attuned to seeing them in the right. environment around us um, and that's worrying at a time when two in five of the world's plant species are now threatened with extinction Gosh. so we need to care about plants you know they're fundamental to our existence um, they're under threat so it's never been more important and our mission is to engage people with the scientific wonder of plants that's what we're truly passionate about well you're doing a fantastic job of it and um, and again the platform we have as you know one of the world's big universities to also champion and, and uh, speak about the work that you're doing. Um, be assured we'll do everything we can and I will to support it. So um, all I can say is thank you so much for spending this time. It's been a real treat for me to get out and thank just you. have this afternoon. Wish you all the very best with the research uh, and the teaching that you're doing. I can't wait to bring some of the medical students down to uh, again show them some of the pain relieving yes. medicines in the physic garden and, um, and I say it's time for that gin and tonic. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs>